Good morning and welcome to South Point Church Online. We're so glad you're here. Grab a coffee and join us for some worship. God, we just invite you into this place. Have your way, God. You alone are worthy of all honor and all glory. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, working in this place. I worship you, I worship you. Waymaker, Waymaker, miracle work, promise keep, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Thank you, Jesus. Waymaker, miracle work, promise keep, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. You are here. Touching every heart, I worship you, I worship you. You are here, healing every heart, I worship you, I worship you. You are here, turning lives. I worship you, I worship you. You are here, mending every heart. I worship you, I worship you. Waymaker, waymaker, miracle work, promise keep. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. He's a way maker, way maker, miracle work, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Thank you, God. Way maker, miracle work, promise keeper. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Way make miracle work, promise keep. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. 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 Way make miracle work. Promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. Way make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. When I don't see it, you're working. 
Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Way make miracle work. Promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Thank you, God. Way make miracle work. Promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. 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 We make miracle work. Promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. We make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. 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 sorrow and dead in my sin lost without hope with no place to begin your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested and my life began ash was redeemed only beauty remained my orphan heart was given a name My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to death When death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace so free washes chains I'm a prisoner no more my shame was a ransom he faithfully bore he canceled my debt and he called me his friend when death was arrested and my life began oh your grace so free washes over Then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand. That's when death was arrested and my life began. Oh, your grace so free washes over me. You have made us new. You. 
tree. Come join the song of all the redeemed. Yes, we're free, free forever. Amen. When death was arrested and my life began, oh, we're free, free forever. We're free. Come join the song of all the redeemed. Yes, we're free, free forever. Amen. When death was arrested, and my life began. When death was arrested, and my life began. That's when death was arrested, and my life began. God, we just thank you for your presence. God, we just thank you for your word, God. God, we pray right now for Pastor Matt that you might speak through him directly to us, directly to what we need in this season. God, we just thank you for being with us and for being present in this place. You alone are worthy of all honor and all glory and all praise. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us. All right. Well, hey, that was great, worship team. Thank you so much for the reminder that Easter is coming, uh, that our current events can't change what Jesus has already done for us, uh, laying down his life so that we could have life and life to the fullest. Now, it's been a great week here at South Point Church. Uh, the church continues to move forward as dozens of small groups are gathering online in Zoom groups. Um, if you're not a part of a small group, but you're interested in maybe exploring what that would look like, um, we're going to be working on creating some new groups here in the coming weeks. Hey, the middle school and high school youth groups are also meeting online. Uh, this past week was their first week uh, and more than 70 students participated and got to enjoy an experience built specifically for them. Now, I peeked over my son's shoulder the other day and I saw them playing crazy games, uh, singing songs of worship. They heard an encouraging message. Uh, they even broke out into small groups. And so if you have a student who's interested, um, the high school meets on Sunday nights. That's tonight in case you're losing track of your days uh, at 6.30 tonight. And then the middle school meets on Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. And uh, so if, if you're not connected to the youth group, if you have a middle school or high school student that wants to get involved, uh, contact Kayla Smith. That's ksmith at southpointforyou.com. Uh, and she'll get you all set up. Lastly, our kids ministry has been out and about this week providing curbside pickup uh, for Sunday morning crafts for kids. And so these go together um, with the kids' videos that are available on the free Parent Q app. Uh, so keep an eye out on social media for where they'll be this week. Um, this past week, it was Friday afternoon at Leonardtown High School and Patuxent High School, but that's subject to change. And so um, if you're unable to get to the school or the curbside pickup, individual uh, delivery is available, but we'd really prefer that we reserve that for families who either have transportation issues uh, or health vulnerabilities that limit your ability to swing by. Hey, as Pastor Matt comes to bring us uh, week three of the series, Anxious for Nothing, let's just take a moment and pray, uh, and let's focus our spiritual ears and our eyes to hear from our Heavenly Father. Join me. Uh, hey God, as we uh, turn our attention to you this morning, God, um, we need to hear from you, and so um, we just pause uh, the, the mental uh, areas of our life, God, and we just focus completely on who you are, God. Uh, we listen expectantly, believing um, that, that your word can encourage us, can lift our heads, uh, and can show us a better way. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Welcome to South Point Church Online. My name is Matt. I'm part of the team here. We want to say hi to all of our local communities. We want to say good morning to St. Mary's. Good morning to Lusby. We also want to welcome those of you who might be watching in different parts of the country or maybe even around the world. We're so glad that you chose to be with us this morning. Hey, we're in week three of a series called Anxious for Nothing. And over this series, we've had one key point, and we're going to put it up on the screen for all of us this morning, and it's this. Anxiety is meant to be a signal, not a state 
of being. Listen, here's what we're trying to say is, listen, being anxious isn't bad. Being anxious isn't a sin. Being anxious just makes you human. But staying anxious or having extreme anxiety is unhealthy. And we've also admitted that anxiety can be complex. And so if you are trying to get help for extreme anxiety or constant anxiety, that is absolutely appropriate. Listen, if you're seeing a professional or under doctor's direction, you're getting medicine, that is not a lack of faith. It's just a fact that we live in a broken world. Now, if you missed weeks one or two of Anxious for Nothing, hey, you can go to our website and catch up, or you can go to our YouTube channel and subscribe there and catch up if you've missed any of those. Today, I want us to talk about something that all of us will experience that will cause anxiety in our lives. It doesn't matter whether you have no faith. It doesn't matter whether you have different faith. It doesn't matter whether you've been a follower of Jesus for tons of years. All of us will experience this thing that causes anxiety. And if you're wondering what this thing is, it's something called FOMO. Now listen, if you're 35 and under, you know what FOMO means. If you don't know what FOMO means, it's okay. I'm going to explain what it is. Matter of fact, we're going to put what FOMO means up on the screen this morning. And FOMO simply means the fear of of missing out. And I created a definition that I think is very accurate. We imagine ourselves missing out on the life we want or deserve while everyone else is living their best life. You see, all of us experience the chaos of the world around us. And we often feel like the chaos will keep us from the life that we want or the life that we deserve. And what makes things even worse is that social media nowadays and our ability to see what everyone else is doing, everyone is highlight real on social media makes us feel like everyone's living their best life while we might miss out on the very life that we want or deserve. Now, I want you to know this morning, FOMO or the fear of missing out isn't my idea. It's not even a church idea. Matter of fact, the fear of missing out is actually something social scientists tells us happens to everyone and that is not good for us. Matter of fact, in my research, I wanted to share with you, there was an article from Very Well Mind. Matter of fact, it was February of this year, 2020, and here's what they say. FOMO or the fear of missing out is a real phenomenon that is becoming increasingly common and cause significant stress. I mean, did you catch that? Like, This series, Anxious for Nothing, yet FOMO causes significant stress in your life. It can affect us, it can affect just about anyone, but some people are at greater risk. And then it goes on to say this, here's what you should know about the history of FOMO, what the research says and how to recognize it in your life and how to manage FOMO to avoid negatively affecting your happiness. It says it causes significant stress and that it can negatively affect our happiness. I like how one article in Economic Times summed it up, and I'm going to put it up on the screen, and it says this. It says studies. So this isn't like some theory. This isn't some idea. Listen, there have been studies about the fear of missing out, and it says studies show that FOMO leads to extreme dissatisfaction and has detrimental effect upon our physical and mental health. Mood swings, loneliness, feelings of inferiority, reduced self-esteem, extreme social anxiety, and the increased levels of negativity and depression. I mean, apparently FOMO isn't good for us. All of us will experience it, but its side effects can be devastating. And it got me thinking, I know I've experienced FOMO. Uh, This just happened to me uh, a couple of weeks ago. I don't know about your weekly schedule, uh, but Sunday is the end of my week for me. I get Monday off and then I start back to work Tuesday through um, Sunday. Um, And it was was a couple Sundays ago. Um, It was about 10 o'clock at night on a Sunday night. And my wife was going to bed. We're usually to bed early, somewhere between nine and 9.30. And she says, hey, you look really tired. It's it's 10 o'clock. Are you going to stay up? And I go, yes. And she goes, well, why? You look so tired. I go, because it's my one night that I can stay up late and I don't want to miss out on it. And she goes, but your eyes are red and you look exhausted. And I go, I am, but I'm not going to miss out on fun. And so I was watching YouTube videos and watching nothing on TV that was worth anything. And I was tired the next morning and she goes, did you have fun? And I go, no, I really didn't miss anything. And what's funny is the fear of missing out on being able to stay late, stay up late, caused me to do something I really didn't even need to do. And it got me wondering, have you ever experienced the fear of missing out? Maybe you've experienced the fear of missing out. Maybe it's when you got an invitation to a New Year's party, a Super Bowl party, or maybe a Christmas party, and someone asked you to that party, and here was your answer. 
maybe. And it wasn't a maybe because you had to check the schedule. It wasn't a maybe because you didn't know if you could go. It was a maybe because you were worried or you feared you might get a better offer from other people at a better party and that you would miss out. Maybe you've experienced FOMO when you were in a social event or social gathering and you were there and you cut conversations short or you even avoided certain people because you feared missing out on talking to your favorite friends or being seen by the right people. You may have experienced FOMO when you were out on date night with your spouse or you were out with a group of friends and you were having a great time. But every 10 minutes or so, you're checking your Apple Watch or you're checking your phone to see what people are posting while you're out and having a good time. Maybe you've experienced FOMO. Maybe you're dating or single and him or her, they're actually a really nice person. But because you fear that there might be somebody better out there, you're really never willing to make a commitment. You might have experienced FOMO this way. If you've ever had a close friend come up and share some really good news, and instead of being excited and happy for your friend, here's what you feel. You feel sadness that you didn't experience what they experienced. It's called the fear of missing out. And we know that it isn't good for us. And it leads you and I to a truth this morning. And I'm going to put it up on the screen. And it's this. Sometimes we'll let FOMO or the fear of missing out drive us to unhealthy extremes. You see, the problem with the fear of missing out is is that it pushes you and I to two opposite ends of the extreme. And it causes us to actually miss out on the very thing that we're trying to avoid. Let me explain what I mean. I'm going to put up the slide. And when you and I experience the fear of missing out, we usually go into two modes that are often extremes. We either go into super control mode or super play mode. And super control mode, it's where we overwork and we overachieve. It doesn't matter whether it's sports or academic or in our careers or in our our relationships. The fear of not having the life we want or the life we deserve, we go into overdrive. And so we're just going to work all the time. We're going to practice all the time. We're going to be with that person all the time. We go into this control mode mode where we're not going to let the chaos of the world keep us from the life that we want. And in this, we can sometimes miss opportunities. Now, the other extreme is we go into play mode. It's where we procrastinate and we go, well, if I make the decision, if I choose that, I may miss out on something. So I'm going to make no decision. Or we go into what I call pleasure. We don't like that fear that we feel. So we want to kind of medicate it with food or alcohol or drugs or porn. Like we just go, hey, I want to have pleasure. And here's what we discovered. When we go into control, control mode or play mode, either of those extremes can lead to unhealthy things. I mean, think about it. There's never enough achievement and there's never enough pleasure to actually cause us to feel fulfilled in life because fulfillment doesn't come from either one of those alone. As I was preparing for our time today, I thought of someone who, who embodied both sides of, this, of these extremes. His, his name is Michael Phelps. He's actually an Olympic swimmer. You've probably heard of him. Won more Olympic medals than any other person in the history. And I don't know if you know this, but for almost a decade, he only got one day off a year during Christmas where he wasn't in the pool two times a day training for his Olympic meets. I mean, you talk about a guy who dedicated a decade of his life to be at at the best. And in that, he realized he was going to make sure that he accomplished what he wanted. But he saw other people having fun and he realized he was missing out. And so he swung his life into play mode and he, he sought pleasure and procrastination and did a bunch of other things that got him in trouble. And eventually he realized that either of those extremes weren't good for him. And he publicly admitted that kind of his fear of missing out on these things led to depression. And I think that's an example of a real life person who went into both of those modes, but didn't end up where they want to be. And it leaves you and I asking one of life's most necessary questions. How do you, how do I, how do we not let FOMO or the fear of missing out steer us to unhealthy extremes? And here's why that question is so important. Because how we answer that question directly impacts the quality of our life. Now, there's some truly amazing, awesome news this morning. You are not alone. 
I'm not alone. We're all in this struggle together. Matter of fact, this is something that God knew that each and every person throughout all of history would deal with. Matter of fact, God addresses this in the Bible many, many times. But there's been this one passage that's been kind of at the core of our whole series called Anxious for Nothing. Now, this passage was written by a guy named the Apostle Paul, right? And the Apostle Paul, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, wrote us this passage that's been at the core of our message this whole series. Now, you have to understand, the Apostle Paul was not in a mansion eating bonbons. Matter of fact, the Apostle Paul, when we go look at this passage, was under 24-hour guard, and he was awaiting trial that may receive the death penalty. And history tells us that he actually did receive the death penalty. And here's what the Apostle Paul wrote to a group of followers of Jesus in a place called Philippi. And this church was made up a lot of everyday normal people like you and I. There were some people who had never been to church. There were some people who grew up in church. And there were some people who came from different faith backgrounds. But here's what he wrote that church about anxiety. And so we're going to look at it this morning. He says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. I want to stop there really quickly and remind us that he's not saying you can't feel anxiousness. You see, Greek grammar and English grammar are very different. This is written in what they call present tense, which doesn't mean you can't feel anxious. It means don't stay anxious. So basically saying don't stay anxious, but in every situation by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. We've been saying for the last two weeks that while anxiety is complex, there is a spiritual component. And the spiritual answer to a piece of anxiety is that when you and I pray or talk to God, when you and I have gratitude or give praise to God, it becomes a vaccine against anxiety. And then it says, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And the word that I want us to focus on this morning together is the word understanding. We're going to take a look at just that one verse. Matter of fact, we're going to go up to the next slide, which is just that verse, and we're going to look at it. And it says, and the peace, right, of God, which transcends understanding, will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. And the reason the Apostle Paul writes this group of people, the reason why God keeps this recorded for you and I, is we need something to guard our minds and our hearts against the fear of missing out that will drive us to unhealthy healthy extremes. And what is it that we need to guard us from those unhealthy extremes? Is peace. We need the peace of God. But what keeps us from peace? It's understanding. If we were really honest, now listen, I know most of you, maybe you have your cup of coffee, maybe your kids are with you, uh, maybe you're chatting online. So I just want to ask everyone if you could just pause for a moment, just, just kind of look right here because you don't want to miss this. When you and I don't understand why we have ups and downs, when you and I don't understand why there's the good and the bad, we will assume the worst. When you and I don't understand the why of life, we often lack peace. We need something that helps us know that even if we can't understand something, that God is still control. And that even if we don't understand, we can have peace. And so this morning, I want to make three brief observations that when you and I let our lack of understanding, our lack of peace to assume the worst, it leads to three things that aren't helpful. And so here's observation number one this morning. Fear wants us to believe that God has forgotten us. When worry causes us to assume the worst, we begin to believe that God is absent, that God has somewhere left the building and nothing could be further from the truth. Now, I want to take a little bit of survey out there. And so even if you're at home, wherever you're watching online, uh, if you're a parent, would you just raise your hand wherever you're at? Just, if you're a parent, raise your hand. Okay, great. Listen, if you're a parent, you understand that. As a parent, you can be present with your kid and just because you're not a puppet master doesn't mean you're absent. Let me give you a true story of what I'm talking about. I have two daughters and I remember when they were little, I was teaching one of them how to ride a bike. Any of y'all ever taught your kids how to ride bikes? It is both precious and scary. Now, I remember when I was teaching one of my daughters how to ride her bike. I mean, we had her in all the gear. She had the helmet and she was buckled up. She had those little plastic elbow pads and little plastic knee pads. And, you know, she had a cute little bike with a little bell and a little basket. It was just, it was so cute. And of course it had training wheels. But when she first got on, 
She wanted me to hold her. And so at first I kind of held her and kind of pushed her along and kind of pushed her along. And she saw the, how the pedals work. And then soon she was like, hey, dad, um, you can let go of the bike and, and let me pedal. And so I let her pedal and she kind of learned how to steer, steer. And she didn't really ever fall with the training wheels. And so we did that for a couple of times. And then came the big day, the day where she said, dad, would you take the training wheels off the bike? So I took the training wheels off the bike and we went out there. And before she kind of rode the bike by herself, I would kind of run alongside the street with her, you know, with one hand on kind of the back of the seat, one hand on the bar, she would pedal and I would run alongside of her. And you know what all little kids do? What do they say when, when they start to think they have it on them? They always say, dad, let me do it by myself. And that's what she said, dad, let me do it by myself. And so I would let go for a few minutes and she would get shaky and scared. She'd go, dad. And then I would grab it. And then she would get shaky and I would grab it. And after she practiced that for a couple of times, finally she said, dad, I can do it on my own. And so I stood on one part of the street and then she started there and then she drove and rode her little bike, right? She, she drove that little bike, right? And then she tried to make the turn and she fell on the turn, right? But she got back up, got on her bike. She wasn't permanently damaged. And and then she, you know, rode the bike back toward me. Now, listen, just because she fell didn't mean that I was absent. Me being present doesn't mean that I have to be a puppet master. And did you know the same is true of God? God never promises you and I a pass from the bumps and bruises of life. God only promises is that he'll be present with us in the midst of those things. I love what Jesus tells us. We see this in the eyewitness account of the gospel, Luke. I love what Jesus says. Here's what Jesus says. We're gonna put up on the screen. He says, are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? Yet not one of them is, what's the word? Forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are numbered. Not only does God know and not forget one single bird that's on the planet, God knows the number of hairs on every single person's head. You are not forgotten. He says, don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. Just because we experience the bumps and bruises of life doesn't mean that God is absent. You see, fear and worry will drive us to think that God has forgotten. But don't forget, you can be present without having to be a puppet master. Which leads me into the observation number two that worry will cause us to assume. And we're going to put it up on the screen here. And it says, fear wants us to believe that God is trying to to punish us. Now, listen, if you've ever been a little kid and all of us at some point were a little kid, right? And we kind of thought, hey, listen, our parents disciplined us or our parents punished us. But if you're here today and you're an uncle or you're an aunt or you're a parent, you know that a parent's primary role is not to be someone who punishes, but to love and care for their kids. And that's exactly what God is. God's primary role is not to punish us, but to be our heavenly father who loves and cares for us. As I was preparing for this, I thought about a conversation that I had with one of my daughters when they were a teenager. As a matter of fact, they were an older teenager. They're hitting that age where they were kind of thinking, hey, I'm an adult. And so, and listen, I just wanted, this is free. You don't have to do anything extra for this. But listen, listen, age does not make you an adult or maturity. How you handle your actions is whether you are an adult or or whether you're mature. But my daughter and I were at this dinner table and I can remember as clear as day. My daughter was making some decisions that I thought, I don't think that's gonna lead to where you want it to go. That seems like an unhealthy, unwise decision. And I think there are gonna be consequences that you don't want from that. And so we were having this conversation and in grace and in gentleness, I looked my daughter in the eye and I said, listen, babe, is it possible that your mom and dad, because we're older, we've experienced some things that you haven't experienced and that maybe we can see some things that you can't see and we're just looking out for your best. We're not trying to keep you from having fun. We're trying to keep you from harm. And unfortunately in that moment, my daughter's hurt, her inability to see that we loved her and cared for us was like, no, I'm gonna do this thing anyway. And then in the middle of this conversation, she said something to me that literally broke my heart. She says, well, I'm gonna do this and you can punish me anyway. And I'll remember that moment. I'll never forget it because in that moment, tears started to come from my eyes. And I made her look at me. I said, babe, would you look at me for a second? And I said, I am your father. I love you. I have no desire to punish you. I love you. I only want what is best for you. Now, listen, if me, a busted and broken guy, 
can love their child like that. How much more than our heavenly father doesn't look at us from heaven going, oh, I just can't wait to punish you. No, no, no. He doesn't want to punish us. Our God in heaven looks to us and goes, I've come that you might have life and life to the full. Jesus tells us the thief has come to steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus came to rescue us so that you and I could experience the life that we were meant to live. Matter of fact, in one encounter that Jesus had with a woman who had barely been caught in something that was pretty wrong and the law had called for punishment and Jesus had answered the crowd. He said, those of you that have never sinned, you go ahead and cast the first stone. And we catch the end of that conversation here, the I was account and the gospel of John. It says, then Jesus stood up and again, he said to the woman, where are your accusers? Did even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus says, neither do I go and sin no more. The gospel of John tells us that Jesus didn't come here to condemn us, but that we could find life for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that we could experience life and life to the full. Never let the assumption of worry drive you to believe that God is angry looking to punish you. Which leads me directly into observation number three, which is this. Fear wants us to believe that God is against us. You see, when the unknown causes worry to assume that God is against us, we will begin to believe that somehow that God is against us. Now this morning, I need to say something a little bit difficult, so I want you to emotionally prepare. When I wrote this, I didn't like this, but I've discovered something to be true of me, and maybe it might be true of some of you. And here's what I know to be true about me. Sometimes when I make a wrong decision, sometimes when I get it wrong, I pick bad or I know I did something wrong, I want to blame others and blame God when I get the consequences for my bad decision. I mean, I'm wondering, has anyone else done that? Like you made a decision that was wrong. You you got it wrong. Maybe it was a bad decision. Maybe you knew it was wrong and you chose to do it anyway. But when you get the consequences and you're like, why'd you let that happen, God? Or you blame your spouse or you blame your mom or you blame your friends. Like at some point, the reality is, is fallen and busted and broken human beings, we will blame our brokenness on others and on God. This reminds me of something that happened to me. Gosh, this was probably six or seven years ago. My wife and I and our daughters at the time were young. They were probably, you know, somewhere between six and nine. And we were on our way back um, from South Carolina, deep in South Carolina. And it was about a 12 hour trip up 95 um, back home here to Maryland. And as we started getting closer to the end, about halfway through, I was like, man, this is tough. And so, you know, that green sign, that blue sign that says 95, it's not the speed limit sign. Uh, but I, I took it as a speed limit sign. So in my van, I was doing 95 on cruise control and I was just in the fast lane, just humming. And when we got into Virginia, I was like, we are almost there. And then I heard the fatal sound of a police car behind me. Woo, woo, woo. And it was a local county sheriff who was kind of sitting on the road, getting all the 95 passerbys who were speeding, which was me. And the officer said to me, he said, hey, that blue sign 95 doesn't, the speed limit doesn't mean it's a speed limit. And I said, I know. And he says, hey, listen, I could, you know, I could charge you with reckless and, but I see you have your family. So I'm just going to give you this ticket. Uh, This ticket is a pretty expensive ticket and you should show up to court for it. Uh, When I got home and looked it up, my ticket was $500. Dollars, And I'm telling you, I was angry. I was like, that su- silly cop, he saw that it was me and my family. We were on our way back from vacation. Aren't any the crooks to lock up? And then I started blaming the county. They just want my money. They just want me to pay this big expensive ticket. But in the end of the day, the reason I got the ticket wasn't because the police guy was doing his job. It wasn't because the county was trying to get money. It's because I broke the speed limit. And sometimes I blame the consequences of the brokenness of myself or the world onto others and God. And that's just not fair. I love what the Bible tells us about how much God loves us. We're going to put it up here on the screen and it says this. It says, but God demonstrates his own, his love. He's not angry. He's not our enemy. It says, but God demonstrates his own love for this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When you, when me, when we were doing our very worst thing, when we were telling God, go pound sand, we don't want you. Jesus said, Father, forgive them. God loves us. He is for us. Anyone that would die for you is for you. 
And so today, my goal is to remind us to not let the unknown, just because we don't understand, doesn't mean we should assume that God has forgotten or that God wants to punish us or that God is against us. No, 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 no. I want you to know today, you can know this truth. God loves you, God cares about you, and God sees you your life. And it leads me to sum up today's message in this kind of one sentence today. Imagined fear. We don't know what the future holds and we don't understand why certain things happen. Imagined fear robs us of the peace we need because it leads us to distrust the real goodness of God. When you and I assume the worst, we begin to distrust the God who died for us and is looking out for us and cares for us. This is one of the reasons that I love Jesus. Jesus is a truth teller. Did you know in the eyewitness account of the Gospel of John, Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. Listen, pain is real. None of us get a pass from it in life. If anyone tells you you get a pass from pain in life, they are either lying to you or trying to sell something. But Jesus doesn't just say, but you'll experience trouble. He puts a but there. He says, but I've overcome the world. You see, no matter what trouble we may be facing now, here's the best news. The tomb of Jesus is empty. Our life will not be defined by trouble, but the empty tomb of Jesus. You can have peace. I can have peace. We can have peace knowing that no matter what is happening now, our future is secure because it is full of goodness and life because Jesus conquered hell and death on our behalf. If you only hear one thing in today's message, I want you to know that God is present and he is close. God loves you and cares for you. God is good and God is in ultimate control. Where we're at today is temporary, but the permanency of the empty tomb means that you and I have life coming as part of our destiny. So I want to close with something that just happened to me. Uh, probably, I think it was last Sunday. Um, it was after church. We had finished up things, filming the online thing for you guys, right? So my wife and I needed to go to the store for a couple of things. And as we were kind of going through the stores, man, you could see the shelves were bare. And just kind of as a public service announcement, if you see something that has the Wick sticker, if you could leave that for those who only have that as an access, you know, for their welfare income, please leave that for them. And so anyway, we were going and picking up a couple items and we passed the toilet paper aisle. And in that moment, I saw that there were a couple things of toilet paper still left. And my wife looked at the same time I did. And then she gave me that look. And here's what she said to me. She says, do you think we should get some more toilet paper? And in that moment, I had every urge to say, yes, let's go grab a couple of things. But if I was very honest, we had enough toilet paper at home, mostly because my wife likes to buy in bulk. And a couple of weeks ago, before this all broke out, my wife had bought several big things because she got like a coupon card with it. So we had plenty of toilet paper. But I was about to let fear drive me to be what's wrong in the world today. And thankfully, because I know God is control. I surrendered my illusion of control and said, no, we don't need more toilet paper. We have enough at home. Let's be part of the solution, not part of the problem. And so that is my challenge to you and I today is what if this coming week, every single day, you, me, we chose to do something than over control or over procrastinate and play or to go into play mode What if you and I chose a different option? What if we surrendered the illusion of control and decided today we're just gonna do the next right thing? Because we have a peace knowing that God is with us, God is for us, and God is in ultimate control. May his peace guard your heart and minds. God bless, let me pray. Hey God, Thank you. Thank you that you love us. God, thank you that you care about us. God, thank you that even in the midst of all the craziness, you are still a God who provides. God, we want to thank you that the tomb of Jesus is empty, that no matter what the temporary situation is, we know how the story ends because Jesus rose from the dead. 
So God, I pray that everyone that is listening or watching this, that we would choose today to allow the peace of God to guard our hearts. Even if we can't understand the whys, we can know that God is good. And we will allow your peace and surrender that illusion of control and choose to do the next right thing. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, well, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, if you appreciated the message, go ahead and hit the like or the heart button there on your page. Um, share it out to social media. This service will be on all of our different uh, platforms later today, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. And so uh, go ahead and feel free to share this out to somebody who might need to hear that word. As we wrap up the service, I just want to brag on our church. Uh, you know, it's easy to do because the church isn't just Matt and I, it's, it's you. Uh, and the church has led the way in radical generosity throughout this crisis. Uh, we're creating opportunities and meeting needs through our after-school program, our partnership with Three Oaks Shelter. Uh, and so we want you to know we've set up a, a COVID-19 relief fund uh, on our giving page that's specifically to resource our existing local ministries. And so we didn't start serving when this crisis hit. We've been in relational ministry for years. So we're positioned to serve and to care uh, in meaningful ways. Hey, I realize that these times are scary and uncertain for many. Uh, but I want to ask, would you consider fighting back against that fear uh, by continuing to be generous in your giving uh, financially to South Point Church, both through the COVID-19 fund uh, and through our general fund? You know, aside from, from not meeting on Sundays at our campus, uh, we've not reduced our ministry. In fact, we've expanded and grown our reach in many areas. And so moving to um, digital platforms and things like that, that has some associated cost. Uh, and so when this crisis passes, which it will, we want to be well positioned uh, to continue the mission to connect the disconnected to Christ's community and a cause. And we can do that together um, as we agree to be generous, to do more together than we can do alone. We made giving super simple uh, by visiting southpointfree.com slash donate. And thanks again for joining us this week. Uh, air hugs and high fives to all of you. Much love and have a great week. Take care.